Last week was Mother's Day, and we celebrated Mother. Do you all remember that? Hallelujah. And then the week, bef- the couple weeks before that, we talked about the word sanctification. Do you all remember that? Nobody? Okay. I barely did, so it's all right. Sanctification. Hallelujah. And so I want to talk to you. Uh, these are big words. Pastor Ron and I were away praying. And the Lord said um, about, he said, sanctification and holiness through grace. Well, I began to, I've told you this, you know, I have um, uh, sermon notebooks literally from A, and now I'm working on Z. And so the next one, and I'm about done with this one, so I guess we're going to go to double A. And that's, that means I've been preaching a long time. And each notebook has about 50 or 60 sermons in it. And so everything I ever have, I have. I have it on a Word document. Doris started it for me way back in the day. And I just, this is how I restudy what I've already studied. And I began to look and I was like, wow, um, there's not much sanctification in there. And there's no holiness at all. And that's bad. And it's like, I, I've mentioned those words because those are Bible words. You know, just like love. And just like hope and just like faith, those are big Bible words. Sanctification, holiness, uh, justification, righteousness, um, you know, consecration. Those are all very big Bible words. And so on Sunday morning, uh, you're going to get some doctrine. Is that all right? Because I know you all, you are not of the itching ears crowd. Because I, I haven't been drawn to anyone. I ain't drawn. I, nobody can draw me to the itch and ear side of things. What's an itch and ear? An itch and ear is tell me what I want to hear. Tell me how good I am. T- don't tell me anything that I got to fix. And sure, don't let the Holy Ghost come and convict me of anything. An itch and ear is I want to hear something good. I want to hear something good about me. I want to hear that I'm okay. I want to hear I want I want to hear that everything is fine with me and fine with the way I think. But dear friend, that is not the gospel. It never has been because the Lord is always, you know, uh, you can look at it, um, he, because he loves us so much, he's always correcting us. Now, he's not going to overwhelm you with correction. And what he's correcting me about may not be what he's correcting you about, but the Lord loves us. And he's always pruning. Why? You know, I, I have these rose bushes in my front yard. And I'm, over the last two years, I finally got back to pruning them. My dad used to do it. And they used to be so beautiful. But then they got ugly. And I thought about just pulling them out because they didn't seem of any good. And I thought, you know what? I think I'll prune them. And the last couple of years, they've been the most beautiful they've ever been. Well, that's your life and my life. You have to do it with a fruit tree. You got to prune it. You got to prune it. And are, are you excited? Well, Pastor, are you pruning today? I'm not sure what I'm doing today. But I do want you to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This is not my notes. So whoever's up there, I want to give you a heads up. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And we'll just, for time's sake, I'll read out of the Amplified Classic. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So you can put up 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I've got to tell you what verse, don't I? Verse number 9. Verse number 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, the Amplified Classic. We looked at this. Okay, so it says, now, now everybody sing with me. Do, not, uh, do you not know the unrighteous and wrongdoers will not inherit or have any share in the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, misled, neither the impure, the immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor those who participate in homosexuality. Verse 10. Nor cheats, swindlers and thieves, nor greedy graspers, nor drunkards, nor foul-mouthed revilers and slanderers, nor extortioners and robbers will inherit or have any share in the kingdom of God. Let's just stop right there. That's God's list inspired by the Holy Ghost to the Apostle Paul. It is the word of God. It cannot be changed. Culture can't change it. The Holy Ghost won't change it. So you just have to understand it. Now, all those lists, they're all equal. They're all equal. They're all equal. Now, some are sins against the body, which are a little bit worse because you're the temple of the Holy Ghost. So I don't know that every sin is equal. I used to say that every sin is equal, but I don't know that that's true according to the Word of God. But how many know we don't want to be any of these? Now look at verse 10. Look at verse 11. And some of you... Were once. Okay? So, but you were washed. Do I got any washed people in the room? 
They got any born again people in the room? Have you been cleansed? Have you been washed by the blood of Jesus? So you and I can no longer, that's maybe who we were, but that's not who he is. That's why I say to you all the time, quit saying you're a sinner. Because you were one. But now you're not one. Because you've been redeemed. I said, you've been redeemed. You're a child of God. And it says, you maybe were one of them, but you were washed, purified by a complete atonement for sin and made free from the guilt of sin. Are y'all free? And you were once, uh, you were consecrated, set apart, hallowed, and you were justified, pronounced righteous by trusting in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. We were what? We, we, were, we were justified. We, we were made clean by the blood of Jesus. Everybody say, I'm clean. Hallelujah. Are you free? And so we looked at this, and, and I'm looking for something here. Um, um, verse 11, again, 1 Corinthians 6, 11. As some of you once were, but you've been washed clean, purified by a clean atonement for sin, and made free from the guilt of sin. Um, you were consecrated. Set apart, hallowed, you were justified, pronounced righteous by trusting in the name of the Lord. And so that word sanctify in the King James, verse 1 Corinthians 6, 11 says, some of you were, but you are washed and you are sanctified. That word sanctified, and we've looked at this before, but really it's the same word for holy. Holy. So we're going to look at, so that's sanctified there. So sanctification and holiness are similar, but not the same. And sometimes in different translations, you can pull that down. Sometimes in different translations, the word, uh, they use the word sanctification, and it's really holiness. And so here, sanctified, remember, means set apart by the masters for the master's intended use. Remember, we used the illustration about the treadmill or the bike that's in your um, uh, bedroom that you're supposed to exercise on, but instead it has become, um, uh, you know, a, 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 um, a treadmill can really hold like, I think I did like 12, 15 pairs of shoes on it if you arrange them correctly. That was not the intended use of the creator for the treadmill. What was it for? To get your behind on it so you can lose some of your behind. <laughs> the exercise bike, if you do it right, you can, you can stack. Because like you come home and you have clothes, you don't really want to put them in the laundry. So they're good for the next day, but you don't want to put them in the closet. So I made a good clothes rack. And on this one I have really personal experience with. Um, you can really, it's a good clothes rack. You can use the seat for things, and I had one a little bar at the, the off of the seat. You can hang, you can like clip things on it. So we got rid of it, and now I actually go to the gym and I actually you know do those things. But my point to you is, and you all know that, is that wasn't the intended use. Are you doing the intended use of your Creator? It's easy. For a creation to do something other than what the creator intended. One of the things about sanctification is you're sanctified to do what God has created you to do. And it doesn't mean apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher are the only ones that are sanctified. You are sanctified to perhaps be a school teacher, an, an attorney, a chef. I always got to get my chef in there. There are some anointed chefs who can throw it down. Jesus likes to eat. Anyway, are you, in, are you sanctified? Okay, so then let's remember that. And now we're going to introduce this, holiness. Everybody say holiness. Now, when I was growing up in my small town in Illinois, there was a holiness kind of church. And it's a small town, and everybody knows everybody. And this church was a strong church. It was really one of the larger churches in our hometown. And in this church, this Pentecostal-type holiness church, um, I always noticed, you could always tell who went there by what their wife looked like. She had long hair, no makeup, no jewelry, and she always wore a dress. And she was mad morning, noon, and night. I met one lady who I loved and adored, still love and adore this day. She was the only nice one I ever met. I think it was those bobby pins sticking in their hair. I mean, I, I would think those hurt. 
And it was always interesting to me that the holiness people, only the women had to look holy and the men looked normal. And so, you know, I, I, and I remember going to that church because I had a friend that went to that church. And, you know, I, I'm grateful that I didn't end up in that church. But, but I, it always bothered me. And it always bothered me that they look sad. If serving God makes you sad, then why would I want to serve him? And, you know, they've taken some scriptures, and I guess just to be real honest, but also uh, these people, when they got in the spirit, these people were some of the most Holy Ghost people in the city. So I ain't making light of that. But there, so holiness then became an outward look, and it never was intended to be. The holiness will affect you on the outside, but it really is like sanctification. It's something that God did for you. Now, this I'm not going to get into this, but this as I was studying and studying, you know, most of the time in the New Testament, when he talks about you and I as the word saint, everybody say, I'm a saint. The, the writers, especially in King James, were afraid to translate it what it really is. So they used the word saint. Now, when we think of saint, we think of a particular, uh, you know, religion that after people die and they do certain things, they become saints. And so in our minds, that's, that's a realm we can't touch. It's just for certain people. And so, but the really, the translation of saints for the most part will be, should have been translated the holy ones. The holy ones. The holy ones. So saints gives it a different names, but, but. Everybody say, I am a saint that makes me a holy one. What is holy? <laughs> Y'all good? What is, what is, so let's, let's give this session, I, 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 because some of you look a little uncomfortable. Like I am, because it's like, oh my gosh, are we getting, you know. So you know, I'm not doing any clothesline preaching, ladies. I believe you ought to dress it up. I believe you ought to do the best you can. All of us, you know, I, I believe the Lord will help you. Hallelujah. And, and so I'm not talking about that. And then holiness is not, so it's not an outward thing first. There are some things with it. But again, it's like sanctification. It's positional. And if you understand this and understand, how many of you know that God is holy? God is holy. And so if he's holy, then we need to understand what the, how that affects us if we want all that he is. Well, let's just do it the way it's in my notes. Uh, let's get this. Uh, so let's talk f about you, that Jesus made you holy. Let's look at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter, y'all ready? Everybody ready? Colossians chapter 1. Believe God with me. Uh, believe God with me for utterance. Believe God that you get everything out of this. Colossians chapter 1, verses 20 through 22. Colossians chapter 1, 20 through 22. Um, it says this. It says, um, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things on earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy. To present you holy. So in, in, by the death of his flesh... And remember, he made uh, peace through the blood of his cross. So there it is again, the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. The body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus has done what? It has reconciled us unto the, uh, the Father. And it says we were once alienated and we were enemies, especially in our minds. And we had wicked works, but now we've been reconciled. How? By the body of his flesh, through his death, and he presents you holy. He presents you. There's nothing you have done yet except receive Jesus. There's nothing you've done yet except get saved. And when he saved you, now to the Father, he presents you holy. He presents you holy. Everybody say, I am holy. He presents you holy because Jesus did something. Not be, and you did something when you believed, but he did something. This is about him. This is about what he's done. This is about how awesome he is. This is about how complete your salvation really is. Amen. He made you. He presents you holy. 
Ooh, as soon as you get washed in the blood, as soon as you said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he was raised from the dead. You didn't know it. You didn't understand it. But he sanctified you in that minute. And he made you holy. And now he can present you. I would like to present to you, Father, one of your sons. One of your daughters who the blood of my blood has washed holy. Come on. I'm clean. I'm clean because of Jesus. Now stick with me. I hear some of your wheels turning. But don't be be giving me no buts right now. All right. 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Verse number 9. Who has saved us? Are you saved? Called us with a holy calling. Okay, now let's move, let's go to Amplified Classic right there. Everybody say, I'm saved and I'm called with a holy calling. For it is he who delivered and saved us and called us with a calling in itself, holy and leading to holiness. The call, it's not talking about apostles, it's not talking about prophets, it's not talking about pastors. It's talking about you, it's talking about me. You are, he... He called you, and, he's, and he, he delivered you, he saved you, and in that moment, he called you with a holy vocation. Hallelujah. And that holy vocation leads you to holiness. Hallelujah. He did it not because of any merit that we have done. You weren't made holy because you, you. You did nothing to make yourself holy. You got to get out of that, no matter what anybody taught you, that I've got to be holy. We'll get to it. Because there's always a God side and a man side. But if you start with the man side, you're religious. And then when you do it, you're proud of you and you take the glory. But when he did it, there is no glory for you. When he did it, there's no honor for you. When he did it, he did it. And if you start, you got to start in the spirit. That's why the Bible says to work out your salvation. It doesn't mean you get a picket. It's that when you get born again, your spirit is alive unto God. And from the inside out, it will affect your body. It will affect sickness and disease. It will affect poverty. It will affect anything and everything. It will affect confusion because that salvation is in you. You are saved. You are redeemed. You are born again. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. You have been sanctified and you've been made holy. Everybody say, I'm holy. Woo, because it's not because of any merit that we have done, but because of and further his own purpose and grace. His grace. Remember, I started out with you teaching on grace. Because the Holy Ghost said to me, sanctified and made holy by grace. Why by grace? Because Jesus did it. There's a God side and a man side. God side, the grace that's available. You have to receive this, though, by faith. Why is this such a big deal? I'm going to tell you why. I don't know if I'm going to get to it today, but I'm going to tell you why this is such a big deal. I'll just give you a preview. If you want to get into his holy presence, you've got to figure out you're holy. If you want to see more of the manifest presence of God, because God is holy. Condemnation. I'm not holy. I'm trying. I'm trying to get there. I'm trying to do right. I'm trying to be right. Well, but... Push that to the side for a minute and understand, I have been made righteous, I have been sanctified, and I am holy. Not because of anything I've done, but because of everything he's done. Because of everything he's done. Because of and to further his own purpose and grace, unmerited favor, which he has given us in Christ Jesus. In Christ, watch this. Before the world began. Your holiness was found in Christ Jesus before you were even thought of. Before the, it was given to you in Christ. The only way you can be holy is in Christ. The only, in Christ. In Christ. It's the only way I can be holy. Well, we're going to get to it. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Whether you know it or not, this is some meat. Ephesians chapter 1, 3 through 5. Blessed be God. And the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. What's a spiritual blessing? Well, holiness is a spiritual blessing. Uh, He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy 
and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Woo, there's a lot in here. Let's look at verse 4 in the Amplified Classic, though. Even, even, uh, first Ephesians, yeah, Ephesians 1, 4, Amplified Classic. Um, even as in love, he chose us, actually picked us out for himself as his own. When someone adopts someone in the natural, they chose them. It's special. No, it's special. I went out of my way to choose you. I chose you. You've been adopted. You know God could have left humanity alone? We've all died in sin and went to hell. Could have went to another planet and started all over again. I don't know. But he chose us, actually picked us. I like that. Thank you for picking me. In junior high, I was always picked last. Except for scholarly things. Athletic things, I was always picked last. I'll take Mark. He picked it. I'm not mad about it anymore. <laughs> Actually, I know I look way better than most of them do um, for my age, and I could probably run circles around them today. He chose us. Actually picked us out for himself as his own. In Christ. Do I need therapy? Anyway, in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy. Come on, everybody say, I'm holy. I'm holy. Consecrated and set apart for him. He chose us. He picked me out. In Christ before the foundation of the world. In Christ. Man, that little book by Brother Hagin, In Him. Pastor Robert teaches it in our Bible Institute. you got to find out who you are in him. In him, by him, for him, through him. Because it's not about you. It's about him. And your faith has to be in him. And you find yourself. He's in you and you're in him. Praise God. Uh, and we are, with that we should be holy, consecrated, set apart for him, and blameless in his sight. Even above reproach. Before him in love. Now I want you to in your heart hold that in love. Hold that, talking about holiness and in love. Interesting what I've discovered. It's always been there, but I finally discovered it. So everybody say, I'm holy. And so that means that you walk in holiness. Okay. Did I lose anybody? Say, I'm holy. And therefore, I walk in holiness. Because of Jesus. Because I'm in him. Because I'm in him. Because I'm in him. Are you in him? Are you in him? Are you in him? Okay, so if you start here, you're starting in the realm of the spirit. If you start here, you're starting with your salvation on the inside, and then it works to the outside. Let me give you some definitions of holiness. It means hallowed, consecrated, or set apart as a sacred use. So as a holy thing, you are set apart. It's like sanctification. You are set apart for a sacred use or to the service or worship of God. It also means this, the state of being holy. Of course, we would know that. But it means purity. It means integrity. It means integrity of moral character. It means freedom from sin. And it means uh, sanctity or to be sanctified. So we are holy. Applied to human beings because everybody, does everybody know God is holy? Are you and I, we're sure of that, right? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is to come. He's holy. He's a holy God. He's holy. He's holy. And you were created in his likeness and his image. And holiness means to be set apart for uh, sacred use or service or worship. It has a lot to do. So applied to a human being, holiness is purity of heart or disposition, sanctified affections, purity, moral goodness, but not perfect in oneself. But it doesn't mean perfect in yourself. It's talking about him. So that's what holiness is. 
And we know that we were made holy in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world. But why do we need to know about holiness? Why? So I want you to look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. 1 Peter chapter, why do we need to know about this? So I am holy because of what Jesus did. But as he which has called you is holy, you be holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. So number one, why do I need to know about it? Because it's a command. It's a command. It's a command. I, and I told because if you read this, you're like, ugh. What do I got to do to be holy? What do I got to do to please him? You got to get born again. No, you got to get born again. And if that's not where you start, you're going to get very works mentality. And that's where the clothesline stuff came. Outward. Because you, you, you can do anything you want with this vessel, but that doesn't mean what's on the inside is holy. That mean, doesn't mean anything about what's going on, on the inside. I can tell you that a lot of my friends and a lot of people I knew, uh, there's another exception. Well, that was her daughter. Uh, something about that family, they got a hold of something that the rest of them didn't seem to have. It was real with them. Their love for God was very real, and it was appealing. But most people, though, they worked on the outside, but they was mad on the inside. That's not the way this works. You know who you are on the inside, and it will work on the outside. It has to work on the outside. It'll eventually, it'll come on the outside. And there's some things you got to do. First of them is you got to understand that being holy is a command. He said, I'm holy. We all agree God's holy. And we all agree he said, you be holy. How do you be holy? I be holy because I'm in Christ. That's where I start. So I am holy. So I am holy. Come on, resolve this. I am holy. I am holy. What does it mean? I'm, I'm, I'm consecrated. I'm set apart. I, I walk in purity and integrity and honor. I am holy. I am holy. It's not a hairstyle. Amen. It's, it's a position in God. Now, so uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Now, this is where some interesting things begin to happen for me. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Um, oh, we're going to read verse 14. And then we're going to see what the Lord will let me do. Follow peace. That word follow means like a person who is hunting gets on their garb and they go on a hunt. Follow peace. What does that mean? With all men. Follow peace. That means I am going to, as, as much as is available to me, I'm going to be at peace with all people. Anyway, where there's agitation, where there's irritation, where there's anger, where there's fist shaking, where there's uh, uh, throwing accusations, that means you're not at peace with somebody. And if right now, if someone stirs you up and you're listening to someone and you come away with irritation, aggravation, you are not doing this scripture. I'll say it again. If you come away from a TV screen, from a podcast, from a post, and it irritates you and aggravates you, that is the devil trying to steal your peace. My peace is not based on anything that goes on in this nation or that nation over there. My peace is in God. And I'm supposed to not just have peace with God. I'm supposed to have peace with all men. It doesn't mean that all men are right. It doesn't mean that all men are doing things correctly. But as it goes with me, I'm going to put on my hunting gear, and that's what follow means, I, like I'm going on a hunt. I'm going on a hunt, and I'm going to find peace with all men. I'm going to hunt it, I'm going to get it, and you can't take it away from me. Don't bring me nothing that's going to mess with my peace. Because I'm not real polite about it sometimes right now. Because the older I get, the plainer I get. Don't mess with my peace. I got too much going on to be bothered by things that are not eternal. 
Now, I want everything while I'm here to go well with me. But if I'll do what the Word of God says, it'll go well with me. I can't control everything, and neither can you. And neither do you need to be getting worked up about everything all the time. That is the devil taking your peace. Come on, I'm going to follow peace with all men. What else am I going to do? I'm going to get on my hunting clothes, and I'm going to go find some holiness. Why? Without which no man shall see the Lord. Now, a lot of people take that means you can't be saved, you're not going to heaven. But if you read, it's, this is so interesting. Um, verse 14 starts the um, sentence. This is the longest sentence I have. I mean, I, I never looked at a sentence before. Because it's like, Lord, okay, there's that. But what? He said, follow the sentence. Because it's at the end, what are those things called? Is that a colon? And so that means the next thing's attached. And then you get to the end of verse 15, and it's a semicolon. And what does that mean? The next thing's attached. And then it goes into, it goes to verse 16, and finally you get a period. And then it starts, you know, some more. And then it, it comes down. But th- my point is, the whole thing is a thought. And this leads you to verse 23. But you are coming to Mount Zion. Unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to its innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which, have been, uh, which are written in heaven, and to the God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that which speaks better of able, the things than Abel. So my point is this. Where, if you want to see God, do you want to see God? It's not talking about when you get to heaven. It's not talking about seeing him face to face. It's talking about seeing him in all that he does in the realm of the spirit. If you want to see God, if you want, if you want God to manifest in your midst, if you want God to manifest in your church, if you want God to manifest in your home, then you're going to have to be at peace with all men. Because God does not show up in controversy. God does not show up in irritation. God does not show up where there's strife and envy in every evil work. Who shows up in the middle of that? That would be be the devil. God needs peace because he is your peace. I don't know if you understand. God needs an atmosphere to manifest himself. Remember Jesus kicked them out when they laughed at him when he said she's not dead just asleep. They laughed him to scorn. You know what he did? He didn't push through the atmosphere. He kicked them all out. Peter did the same thing because he learned. I can't work in this atmosphere. God's not coming in this atmosphere. Everybody get out. God works in certain atmospheres, and he doesn't work in certain atmospheres. And that's why we've always worked around here to keep a certain atmosphere. Don't you mess with my atmosphere. I need God to come. I need God to come. People are going to walk through those doors, and they need a miracle. They need God to intervene in their marriage. We've had many people come in, and this was their last stop on the way before they did something stupid. This was it. They don't need a bunch of religion. They need the presence of God. They need the presence of God. Where, how do we get the presence of God? Follow peace with all men. Why do you think the devil is working so hard to get everybody out of peace with one another? Why do you think he's working so hard at it? Because he knows the word, too. He can misquote it with the best of them. He rests it, he, and he, but he uses things against the body of Christ that he knows. He even told the word to Jesus. And Jesus said, you, you misinterpreted that. Let me tell you how it's interpreted. Listen, y'all, people can throw out scriptures all day long, but you can pull them out of their place. You know the integrity of the word of God, and you know God, and he likes him some peace. And holiness. Holy people set apart, consecrated. Why? So they can see him. So they can see him. Now, um, verse 10. Let's back up. For they verily for a few days chastened us. So it's talking about God. um, This whole chapter is talking about the Lord chasing us because he loves us. He loves me. I don't know if he loves you. Um, because because when he chastens you, he deals with you as a son or a daughter. 
if you don't mess. See, the problem is when God quits messing with you, you're in trouble. No, seriously, you're in trouble. If you don't feel corrected anymore about a sin, you're in trouble in that area. You're in big trouble. Big trouble. You've seared your conscience, and God himself has moved on. So you hit rock bottom. Hopefully you can call on him. God's long suffering, but he's not forever suffering. Praise the Lord. Woo, thank you. For verily for a few days they chastened us, talking about our natural fathers after their own pleasure. But he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. So God begins to then. So why? Why? Because then at the end it says, because without, we have to follow peace and holiness because we want to see the Lord. Do y'all want to see the Lord? Do you want to see him manifest? We get to see him manifest here a lot. But I want to see him more. I want to see him more. I'm looking forward to more and more divine interruptions. I'm looking forward to God being God in our midst. But I have to cooperate. How? Follow peace with all men. Doesn't mean all men are right. Come on, has, you, ha, ha, has someone ever done you wrong and they were totally wrong and mm, you would like to pray, Lord, get them, but you know better than that by now? And then the Lord made you apologize and you're like, what about them? And he said, this is not about them, this is about you. This is not about them, this is about you. Yeah, but they're the wrong ones. They're wrong. You know they're wrong. I know they're wrong. You know they're wrong. You know they've done me wrong. But then he tells you to apologize to them. Ask for forgiveness for anything you said. And you said one or two words and they said 100,000. You made a sideways post, but they made a direct post. Right? And the Lord's telling you. Why is he telling you? Because he knows you want to see him. Because he knows you want to see him. They don't want to see him. They don't care nothing about him. But he knows you want to see him. 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 So he's got to reposition you to see him. See, I need to see him in my house. I need to see him in my finances. I need to see him in my physical body. I need to see him in my mind. I need to see him in my children's lives. I need to see him. And I'm, therefore, I'm not going to let anything keep me from seeing him. So I'm going to have peace with all men. If they don't want to have peace with me, that's fine. But as for me and my heart, we're, go- we're at peace. We're at peace. And equally important, holiness. Well, what do I know about holiness? I got mine from the Lord. Where'd you get yours? I got mine from him because I'm found in him. I'm saved. I'm redeemed. I'm made righteous. I've been sanctified. I've been set apart. I've been made holy by the blood of the lamb and by the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. (laughs) Hallelujah. Oh, I got so much to tell you. Okay, I've done my best because... Uh, the second service, you know, I don't want them to be like, well, we're going to drag in here at 1130 because Pastor keeps the first service so late. But, uh, and, I, and it's, it's 1030 and it's time to go, but you got to have one more scripture. You can't, you can't go off, of, you can't go, I can't leave you there. First Thessalonians, because I want you to think about this until next Sunday. I want you to think about this. I want you to think about this until next Sunday because it, it's so big. First Thessalonians 3, 12 and 13. Why holiness? Why? Why does the Lord need you holy? Why does the Lord want you aware of your holiness? Why does he need you to have revelation about your holiness? And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love. Remember I told you to put that love at the side? Love and holiness, the love of God and the holiness of God are inseparable. God is love. God is holy. The love of God is and the holiness of God are inseparable. And therefore, we as his people, the love of God and the holiness we walk in are inseparable. 
And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love toward one another. Not just your love to God, but yes, I love the Lord my God with all my strength, all my heart, my soul. But I love my neighbor. Who's your neighbor? Everybody's your neighbor. I love my neighbor as I love myself. So increase and abound in love one toward one another and toward all men. Just in case you had any doubts. Toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness. The love of God that you walk in is equated to the amount of holiness you walk in. And the amount of holiness you walk in is the equated to the amount of God you see. The amount of love you walk in towards one another. Come on, don't you see why the devil is trying so hard to get you out of love one with another? Now, our church is a picture uh, of everybody from all walks of life. We're a multicultural, multigenerational, multinational church. And, and yes, are there some challenges sometimes? Yeah, but God's doing it here. Hallelujah. You are a sign and a wonder. Don't, don't let anybody get you out of the sign and wonder thing that you're a part of. To the end that he may establish. Why do you need to walk? Oh. Why do you need to walk in this love? Love and holiness are inseparable. If the devil can get you out of love, then it tarnishes your holiness. And if it messes with your holiness, it messes to the amount that you can see God in your life. And you need him. And you need him. But on the other hand, if I walk in the love of God that's shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Ghost, if I'll not be offended, if I'll not be offended and I won't take offense, if I walk in that love of God to everybody, I walk in that love, I I, I hold on to that love, I walk in the love of God, and, and I know that I've been made holy, I've been made righteous, I've been sanctified by the blood of Jesus and by his body. I am holy as he is holy. Then what's going to happen? Then I'm going to open up some things and I'm going to get to see more of God in my life. To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his holy ones. With all his holy ones. With all his holy ones. Everybody say, I've been made holy. 